Hello, welcome. My name is Shaquille Feldbaum and this is Feldbaum Studios. I am a 3D designer and I've been kind of using the skill for a while now to just create basically my own utopia in a way. I would kind of imagine what my world would look like in an ultimate scenario and then kind of go from there to figure out how the things in that world would look like. That's how I work. So that has kind of set me on a path to start analyzing what all of these car companies and just basically production companies and design houses in general are doing. So I study everything. I've also been looking at Bugatti for quite a while because Bugatti has always been Volkswagen or basically the Volkswagen Group R&D project house. They're just giving Bugatti a blank check and they go and tell them like, this is the technology that is available. Look what the best car possible is that you could make if the budget just doesn't matter. So what Bugatti went and did is they spent a couple billion dollars on production facilities that were to test the, the engine for the Bugatti because the regular one that they use for the regular car engines basically almost exploded was set on fire by the engine it was just producing so much heat that you just don't have the facility to kind of you know you know circulate all of that heat out of there without causing massive overheating issues for the entire building so they had to invest massive amounts of money to kind of produce all of the testing facilities that would be required to build this car so that was also why jeremy clarkson i believe said that they lose like three million for every single car that they sell and it was a sticker price of two million so that would mean that it cost like five million a car to build them and also uh, they built like 450 of them so that you would almost come at like a 3 billion 2.5 billion number for the total production cost of that car so basically that is always what bugatti has been for the volkswagen group and what they got out of that is that they had the double clutch gearbox introduced for the first time and um, the double clutch gearbox kind of allowed a car to have a thousand horsepower and still put it down on the road and have just a button behind the wheel that you could click to shift your gear instantly and you would just always have power whenever your foot went down so that all of a sudden made it a reliable car but if you then downscale that gearbox and you now use it in a way to optimize the efficiency for economical cars e economical cars then you all of a sudden have a solution that would make your Volkswagen Golf all of a sudden more efficient so it allowed Volkswagen to put this in uh, the smaller cars that they produce 30,000 of in a day and get all of their emissions down and all of those billions of dollars that they spent on getting the R&D development for the Bugatti paid off tremendously down the line. Uh, so that was kind of that is kind of the method of development of how R&D works within a big conglomerate like folks like Volkswagen. So basically all of these sports companies are just the test beds of how they're going to make economical cars. That's why Audi Lamborghini is in a collaboration and all of that stuff. So you just basically take what you learn from racing and apply to efficiency cars or economical cars because the name of the game is efficiency. They both do the same thing, whether it's racing or fuel saving. So that is basically what I've been kind of studying. And this motor that Bugatti produced, also to come back to that, it apparently, like Chris Harris had in a Joe Rogan interview. But what they actually set out to do was to do 250 miles an hour safely and reliably. That in itself is bonkers. I mean, when you talk to the engineers about the engine, it's rated at, what, over 1,000 horsepower. But apparently, you know, it can put out so much more. It can, you know, it could have 1,300 horsepower if it needed to without even thinking about it. <laughs> So that statement right there, that is all that you need to hear because a Bugatti motor is an 8 liter W16 with 4 turbos on it. If you look at a, a regular naturally aspirated motor that is properly engineered, it's supposed to be able to run at about 100 horsepower per liter. So if you just imagine like that Bugatti motor having no turbos on it, it should already be possible that it produces 800 horsepower because it's an 8 liter motor. Now you strap four turbos on it and you just get 200 more horsepower? Doesn't make sense. So the case is, is that they just undertune the motor, downgrade it so that it can run reliably. And it just becomes a case of heat management. How much of that horsepower that you still have in the, um, the amount of fuel that you're burning can you actually transform into motion of the car instead of producing heat energy and that is what a lot of cars do almost 30 percent of all the energy that is in fuel is only being transported into actual movement 70 percent is exhausted in just heat so that is one of the battles that people have with these cars so what they do with this engine is that they just look at how much cooling can we provide to keep this car running but the base of the motor is still the same as it is from 2005 the only thing that they keep changing is the heat management system so that they can turn the turbos up a little bit. So um, 
when it now comes to this Bugatti Bolide, it's a whole different question because I also need to show you just how huge the block of that motor is. So let's go to a video of just the Chiron itself. So this is basically a scenario of the engine block of the Bugatti Chiron. It's it's huge compared to a regular motor and the um the engine block is basically this section right here all of this is intercooler these are the turbochargers this is the exhaust manifold and this is the gearbox and basically where you will sitting is on either side of this gearbox section here that is where the, the compartment is of the driver and then here beneath the uh, exhaust you have like the drive shaft coming out so this is basically where the rear tire will sit but this is a massive unit that car weighs two tons basically because of this motor i think it's it will weigh probably like 800 kilos or something it's it's massive so this is the motor that is producing all of that heat so if you're now capable of exhausting all of that heat because you no longer have to think about the bugatti road regulations and making it for you know the street still and having an elegance but you can just really like unleash all of that potential and that is basically what the bugatti bullied is that i'm trying to get into right now so um i'm gonna get over to that video and show you all of that about that one very fine engine and gearbox wow that is enormous it's huge, isn't it? It is. It's Absolutely enormous. It's vast. And then you look at it and you think, where does this fit in the car? Because when you look at the car, yeah. there's no way there looks like there's a place for this. But I mean, one, uh, one thing to say is, mm. why is it this big? Mm. Well, apart from the fact that it's 16 cylinders. Mm. The reason that the engine is big is, is pretty much durability. This is, this is the key to everything. I mean, we've got cars which have done well over 100,000 and you drive them and they've had the regular service in, but they're good as gold, they feel like a new car. You could get 1500 horsepower from a much smaller V8 if you wanted to, mm. but you're talking about a very short service life. So this is still at less than 100 horsepower per cylinder, of course. So that's a little bit of a shot at Koenigsegg, I believe, but that's because I'm some corporate rivalry type shit, I don't know. Um, but basically what they're saying is that this motor is underrated. That's basically now how far we got with the Bugatti Chiron, so now they're at 1500 horsepower. And let's now get into the Bugatti Bolide. Let's go and meet Stefan. He's going to show us the underpinnings of the Bolide. I wonder how far Bugatti will go this time. Further than we ever did before. Andy, a very warm welcome here at Bugatti Engineering. Thank you very much. Great to see you. So what if, what if we take our W16 8 liter capacity engine and make a very radical concept out of that? The result is the Bugatti Bolide and uh, we simulated a lot with that car and the results are breathtaking. Staggering. To achieve this, uh, you have to have a lot of innovations, material-wise, concept-wise, in the car. For example, this one. Auxiliary shaft we have here. Uh, the auxiliary shaft brings the power. I'm gonna pause it right there. So, what this car basically is, is the next generation of Volkswagen Group research and development. Um, over the last couple of years, what has been happening is that metal 3D printing and artificial intelligence have kind of had an exponential rise that just isn't paralleled with anything I've seen before in technology development-wide things. So you can now have a computer that looks at a certain object that will be in the car that is under stress, and it will be able to look and analyze that component and see where the fill points will be, where it needs extra material and where the, the actual force is not really being guided through the material so that it can eliminate material there to come up with a shape that is perfectly made to cancel out any type of stresses that will be put on. That technology wasn't really capable before because we didn't have the artificial intelligence. But what if we did have the artificial intelligence, but we didn't have metal 3D printing? Then you wouldn't really be able to fabricate all of those things because the freedom and the shapes that are being produced by these algorithms and these artificial intelligence programs are more like nature, more shapes that come from nature, like tree branches and stuff like that. That is what it kind of turns out to look like. So you would need like a CNC access machine that had such a fine tip on it and could bend across angles that weren't basically possible to kind of hone all of those shapes out if you would have to use that previous method of development and method of production. But with metal 3D printing, because it's a process of just layering things over one another and kind of having the support material from the previous layer being 
uh, the metal powder that is being spread layer across layer across layer and just being laser etched together you have a full range of freedom of design and you can metal 3d print internally once without having to use a bolt to put them together there's just a bunch of crazy things possible with that stuff so um and this car is basically the result of all of the technology being put to the test to be able to release that motor to its full potential with the strength of like a tank. This thing would be basically bulletproof damn near for, without the exception of the glass, of course, but it's a tank. From the gearbox back to the rear axle. And um, it's a hybrid part made out of carbon fiber and uh, with titanium fittings, half the weight, but twice as strong as the regular one. And to think it can take all that force. Yeah, and if we walk around, there's another part I have to show you. So this is the part of a front suspension, it's double wishbone um, suspension, and this is the push rod. Okay, they're gonna continue on the push rod and that it can lift two Bugatti Chirons just because of that small component. All of that is cool, but that's not really the crazy thing about what they just showed you. It is all in that blue yes, push rod triangle that you I just saw. To show you. So this is the part of a front suspension, it's double wishbone. Uh... So right here, this push rod triangle that is linked to that wishbone that he's describing in his hand right now. This has been um, basically designed with generative design to have the smallest frontal area cross section it could possibly have. Because this part is open in free space in open air, so it would uh, disrupt the um, you know the aerodynamics of the car. So basically, what they did is they just plugged in into the computer that that part is supposed to carry the weight um, that is quite similar to what this part can handle. So it's supposed to be able to carry all of that downforce, also being pressed on uh, the wheel and everything, the force of the car, the weight of the car, everything when it's going over bumps, all of that. So um, if you plug into the computer the data that that is the force that is going into that triangle and you then select that the purpose of this part is supposed to be maybe not an ultimate lightweight but the minimum uh, front, uh, front area cross section then the computer will just come up with this result for you and you have a part done that is way lighter than any type of thing that would be possible to make with human engineering without using artificial intelligence of course so it's that level of detail of engineering that kind of goes into these parts and with serious metal 3d printing now it is going to be you know as as long as you buy enough of these metal 3d printers and make the investments you're going to be able to put this stuff into production cars because you could print like maybe a hundred of those triangles with serious metal 3d printing almost in an hour or so and then you would still have to harden them and things like that. But that is the pace that is going in. So you still have to put them in a furnace, all of that. But you could do production level uh, amounts of this stuff if you have series metal 3D printing for certain components. So um, it's getting crazy. And this is what the future is literally for the next 10 years. Front suspension. And this is the push rod. And uh, yeah, it's printed out of titanium. Incredible. Because it weights... 100 gram and the wall thickness varies between 0.5 and 1 millimeters uh, it has an inner structure printed inner structure and the braking force of that part is 3.7 tons so two chirons yes basically two chirons honestly it's ridiculous how light that is when you consider how strong it needs to be it's beautifully made. So what he said, it also has an internal structure to it. So it's not just either hollow or solid, but it will have like a sort of a bone marrow type structure in the walls of that design to kind of optimize also the force going through that part. So it's also those level details that you can make sure that, you know, it's optimized in every single way, even underneath the skin of these components. So it is, uh, it's getting weird, but that, that's Would the future. Did you miss this one? Yes, of course. Ah, uh, okay. As you know, of course, um, to get the air through the car, around the car, uh, in the right way, it's very scientific to have the airflow there where you want to have the airflow. And uh, basically, the car has an adjustable front splitter, adjustable rear wing, a three-layer rear diffuser, and on the top we have air intake for the engine and there we have inflatable bubbles uh, on that air intake. On high okay, speed. so this also freaked me out. So. Um, this is basically like a flexible skin technology that kind of allows you to inflate and deflate in different aero zones. And it is very interesting to kind of look at what that might bring, you know, what that might introduce next to car design. Because what it is doing is for the air intake, the RAM air intake that is sitting on, um, you know, on the top of the roof, 
it is producing a high air pressure zone on the inside of it because there is air coming in at very high velocity and then all of a sudden it tries to slow down because it is now inside of a tube and it is kind of introduced into a way larger cavity with the the um the air box and everything the collector where it's coming into the turbos so you will have a very high air pressure zone going into that ram air system and then you'll have a very low air pressure zone on the top section of it so it will kind of on the bottom side be pushed out that is kind of what you're seeing here and on the top section it will be sucked out and that shape of these bubbles will kind of become little vortex generators and vortex generators is basically something on the surface of a car or object that is trying to disrupt the, the laminar flow going over it and turning it into a vortex like a turning point is that that is what you can see right here and what those mini vortex generators are doing is basically that it is smoothing out the airflow and kind of a vortex is kind of easier to stick to a surface than a laminar airflow because it is creating suction itself so you can be able to then smooth out the airflow and really have it follow the guide curve that is um, that is needed to kind of get it underneath that wing because the lower section of the wings actually where that suction is being produced it's not being pushed pushed down it's being sucked down so that is where you want that air to go so that is basically what you can do to optimize the the, um, the airflow going to the rear wing with these little bubbles and creating vortexes on the surface of it at higher speeds and um, at lower speeds you will basically just reduce the um, reduce the surface area of that car by just keeping it flat and then you still have you know surface attachment with, with the airflow going over it but at higher speed you can kind of get detachment and that then it will kind of help so that is why this system is crazy and we're just using mixed materials and also having like flexible carbon fiber that you see on the McLaren speed tail and just all of those innovations are going to bring a next generation of cars that we haven't seen yet. I think only this car and now the Aston Martin Valkyrie are two of the cars that kind of really tap into the potential of what all of these technologies can offer. So I'm getting, you know, I love this stuff. If you inflate those bubbles, the air stays on the car without any kind of turbulences so the, that you get a better airflow on the rear wing and on the same way you have more downforce. And so that is kind of going back to um, so the triangle that I just described how it works. So here you can see it placed in the car but you can also see that it is exposed into the open air when it is kind of driving around so that is why you would kind of optimize it because it is you know part of the airflow and the, the surface area, the front area of the car. So that is why you minimize it. Finally. So we've seen the underpinnings of the car and some of the exotic lightweight materials. Oh wait, actually. Okay, so what you can see here, this is all, so basically if you sometimes look at a Ventador or a Lamborghini that has like an air intake drafted on the side of the car, most of the air entering into that radiator is not actually coming from the side, it is actually coming from the front of the hood right here, so it's kind of naturally following this guide curve of kind of going along the side right there instead of like flowing into it from that angle. So that is more like a design cue than an actual aerodynamics thing. So that's also why the McLaren P1 and the 720S have these um, interior door sections where air is kind of flowing in. So it's using that same system. But if you want to kind of have a super, not supercharge the air, but if you want to have like a very clean, fast airflow, high energy airflow into this radiator right here that you would probably need to keep everything cool, whether it is like motor cooling or intercooling with the turbos and stuff. Um, you would kind of want to optimize and maintain as much of the energy of that airstream that is going into there. And then you want to make sure that the air just doesn't come in contact with a lot of things to keep it energy intact. And that is why you would optimize it and why, why it is probably as important as possible to keep that component very thin and um, make sure that it doesn't disrupt any airflow for this radiator right here. So that is kind of crazy to see. That's cool. So we've seen the underpinnings of the car and some of the exotic lightweight materials that were used in the manufacture. And now we still don't get to see the car because it's covered in this rather colorful camouflage. And with all those things that Stefan was talking about, where they saved weight using amazingly light materials, the result is a car that weighs 1,200. But you can kind of see it in the shape of this thing. Like this whole rear section is so massive because that bubble is still there, but the cockpit is a small section. I bet this thing is just as wide as it is because it needs to be for that motor, but it kind of still looks as if that cabin could have been even shrunk down narrower, but the, the engine would still just stick out on both sides. So this thing looks crazy if you look at it from that way. That This bubble here in the rear is regularly not that shape on a car. If the, the headline, the highest point is supposed to be here, 
that line could have been wrapped down like this much and it would look totally more like a bubble shape but they just need all of that body work for that motor to sit in there this is one of the most crazy packaging jobs in engineering that has probably ever been done like forget formula one stuff to get all of that stuff under there this motor to get it in a body shape like this it's it's, it's the weirdest thing i've ever seen if you look at it from this angle right now it's just completely out of proportion like that 40 kilograms incredibly light for a 16 cylinder two-seater car and if we come to the back the heart of the car we see of course the w16 engine now this engine produces 1600 horsepower on regular 98 octane fuel but using 110 octane race fuel it can produce 1850 horsepower so coupled with that low weight this gives us a weight to power ratio of 0.67 Okay, so this, this needs to be put into perspective. This is out of this world. This is 1850 horsepower. So there are multiple cars that can kind of get to that, but most of them are electric. So they probably weigh close to two tons, if not heavier. So if you want to get a power ratio that is up to that number, the 0 0.67 kilos per horsepower, um, that is crazier than Aston Martin Valkyries. That is crazier than Koenigseggs. That is ridiculous it's yeah it doesn't make sense quite honestly because acceleration numbers you would get to 500 pretty easily and fast too if you just have the arrow set up to not produce too much drag and that car the way it is set up it's minimized if you just you know lower wings and stuff it shouldn't produce too much drag if you kind of also have an ability to maybe shut off a couple radiators and things like that you could you could go for crazy top speed numbers kilograms per horsepower and importantly a weight to torque number of 0.67 kilograms per newton meter so what does this actually give us in terms of acceleration on track? well the bugatti engineers have done some simulations and incredibly this car could lap the nordschleife in five minutes and 23 seconds but then importantly perhaps for me i can relate to this very well a lap of the le mans circuit in three minutes and seven seconds that's seven seconds faster than any LMP car has ever lapped Le Mans. That's even faster than that LMP1 prototype that Porsche made, that 919 um, Evo. And that was supposed to be faster than Formula 1 cars. So incredible performance, and I really can't wait to try the car. So let's go. That sound. Hold up. Bugattis have always sounded monstrous because it's just two V8s bolted to the same crankshaft, 16 cylinders going off like every two rotations of the crank. Like it's it's absurd to hear what that thing can do as soon as it kind of launches. And, but then it's kind of still in the side of a luxury car, so it still needs to be somewhat tamed and have kind of, you know, regular road usability. So then you don't really get all of that. And it's really muffled also with like, um, you know, like... Um, Got a little converters and stuff, but not to kind of hear it fully unleashed. That is that is crazy. So yeah, let's check this out. Oh, we're always talking about form follows performance. And now I can see exactly what you mean. At least in the very beginning, it was only uh, form following performance. What really would happen if we strip Bugatti Chiron of all You see that motor right there comfort, is huge. And then position the driver quite a bit more extreme and lower in the car. And then almost shrink wrap. I love these type of te technical videos when they're just really going to like a rolling chassis. But to me, to see him lower into that drivetrain and stuff and just to see that the top of the intake is still sitting higher than his head. That is just what is driving the roof line now instead of the actual height of the driver. What would regularly do it. That is a totally different point of view to designing something to what you would regularly do it. So, I don't know. This, this car is very weird to me i don't really like the design to be quite honest with you like but i've never really been a fan of bugatti design and that is just something personal with me but um i'm very like intrigued about all of the technology and everything that goes into making this type of thing so i appreciate the effort for sure but it's just a, a weird thing for me that i don't really like the way it looks but how they got to this point is it's an amazing process
and heads off, like really. Area around the driver and the technical components and make it an ultra minimal and ultra performant concept. That became the project Bodied. And then when I look at the frontal area of the car, actually all I can see now is, is form following performance. For the first time we're streaming the air through the internal part, meaning inside of the front wheels around the main monocoque. So you can Bugatti does this best. These analytical drawings that they make, it's it's uh, I think the, the best company I see doing like these sort of promo pieces that they do for it. Um, but just in case you like you didn't see it, so this is like a, a hot air radiator exhausting here so that is the first one but this is the airflow that i was describing earlier with the triangles from the push rod trying to minimize that surface area the disrupted least because this is probably one of the most important intercoolers i think that would be the intercooler but i don't know for sure because i haven't seen that part of the car um but that is just basically what i was describing and here you can just see how that airflow is going over that triangle and going into these internal components into these sections for those uh inner coolers and stuff so yeah this is I, I love seeing posters like these see that performance and aerodynamic development dominates the frontal appearance of the car and when we go around the side that story actually continues raw air into the roof scoop hot air traveling along the cabin fresh cool air traveling in this light blue channel towards the intercoolers and then hot air coming from the water coolers through this enormous negative scoop behind the front wheel and then cool air again traveling on the bottom into the oil coolers and exiting. But those negative shapes too, that is almost, I would say that these bodies, these body panels probably have 3D printed molds for them or they're 3D printed in certain sections themselves because you would need to have just the shaping of these, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get this done and also uh, get them rounded and get them into one component and stuff. So there's a lot of crazy techniques going around. Also, one thing that I could probably share, um, I've been to Formnext in 2019. So uh, when I went to Formnext in Germany, it was um, a gentleman from a company that was kind of explaining to me how you would make hollow carbon fiber shapes. So that was, would be how McLaren makes the seat structures and also how um, I think Koenigsegg make their rims. So it is basically like a process of 3D printing a certain material that will kind of expand in an autoclave at that temperature where you're baking your carbon fiber at. So you just make like a tool that is um, that you can put your carbon fiber in from one side and then your, uh, your, um, your female tool would kind of be this 3D printed substance that would expand. And that way you can kind of get it into a mold and then that mold would kind of um, expand and put pressure on the component to make sure that it would harden as a carbon fiber component but then as soon as the heat kind of releases it kind of retracts again and becomes small enough to kind of extract it from that mold so that would be a crazy process and I think that is kind of how you could get to shapes like these so that is also um, one, of, one of those processes of making hollow carbon fiber structures and tubes and all of this weird aero stuff that um, is coming up so I'm, uh, I'm studying a lot so when it comes to the design i'm not too much of a fan to be quite honest it's too much uh star wars for me i'm not you know too much into that um said with the tail lights and stuff so you know everybody's allowed their own opinion i don't um you know i'm it's not a shot at bugatti or something but it's just not not for me um but basically what i was trying to get into is that um the aerodynamic part is it is quite amazing because all of that heat is really being evacuated and basically with aerodynamics on the rear section of a car as soon as you have like a panel that is standing vertically it will kind of be able to produce and drag a vacuum behind it so if you eliminate any surface area basically being standing up vertically or being a panel of, of some sort um, at the rear you will kind of eliminate a lot of the drag that would be able to be produced from it so um, at the rear section of the car so basically what you're seeing is all of these thin elements that are just releasing air flows and just kind of allowing all that heat to evacuate and not get stuck behind or past any of these um, any of the body panels or in the area that are already there so also you know massive double wing elements right here and all uh, you know end plates that are integrated from the front from the rear wells to also have a separating airflow from the turbulence being created from the rear wheel so it's crazy it's a very it's going to be an extremely fast car one of the fastest we've seen before and i think it's going to get very close to formula one numbers on certain tracks um and it is four wheel drive still so 
acceleration will also be crazy with 400 millimeter rear tires like that is on four wheel drive still and on the front is 330 340 i believe but um yeah so so this car basically it's it's an engineering exercise that blows my mind from that perspective when it just combining just the mechanical engineering of that motor the heat management that you're dealing with the aerodynamics the um the, the structural rigidity when it comes to these metal 3d components that are way stronger and lighter and just the whole research and development side of this project is kind of what i live for to kind of see out of these companies and learn from and um trying to see what the next step is going to be so um i hope to kind of start making use of all of these technologies myself pretty fast and i think um with the video game that i'm developing and that i'm working on it's also going to be very technology oriented and all of these type of concepts will kind of be involved into the storyline as well so for the people that are interested in the work that i'm doing there please stay tuned and more is coming for sure um let's see if there's still anything interested but otherwise that is kind of where i'm gonna leave the video so that's where i'm gonna leave the video thank you guys so much for watching also please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to this youtube channel if you're interested for more content to come and for all the people watching for video game development there's more coming soon i'm just working very hard on other people's projects at the moment so i just need to time manage things a little bit better but still thanks for watching and more coming soon my name is shaquille feldbaum i'm out